Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this event. Uh, we're here to draw attention to an aspect of the national border crisis, the mass migration crisis, uh, that gets far too little attention in terms of its impacts on U.S. national security and on the migrant flow as a humanitarian crisis. Uh, we wanted to uh, choose to talk about the Darien Gap, which is a uh, wild jungle passage that connects South America to North America as a migrant route. The numbers of migrants, as uh, a lot of uh, you already know, uh, have hit historic heights uh, overall that have reached the border. Uh, 1.7 million as of the end of October. It's probably closer to 1.9 million once we get the November numbers in. The vast majority of those migrants are from Central America and Mexico. Uh, however, uh, we draw attention to the Darien Gap because uh, probably another record is the, that migrants from 150 different countries also are coming in the greatest percentages that we've seen. Uh, the way that those migrants are reaching our border is often to fly into South America and make their way to Colombia. We have a map up here that kind of shows the uh, general idea. Uh, we are looking at a large number of South Americans, such as Brazilians and Ecuadorans and the like, but we also are seeing a tremendous number of people from outside the hemisphere and also from Haiti, uh, huge numbers from Haiti and Cuba, the Caribbean, but also from places like Syria, Pakistan, uh, all the countries of the Middle East, uh, a great many countries of uh, Central Africa, Northwest and Northeast Africa, uh, the Mauritanians, Senegalese, uh, people from uh, place, countries that are uh, afflicted by terrible tribal warfare. Uh, we don't know who these people are. We talk about the Darien Gap as a, 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 a route that is a diplomatic problem for the United States as much as it is a border control issue uh, because there are three countries that are involved, uh, Colombia, primarily Colombia, Panama, and Costa Rica. Uh, those three countries form what we call a choke point, a bottleneck, a place where this migration could be stopped or retarded or reduced if we needed to to, or wanted to do that if somebody were to pay attention to the, the issue here. Why should we pay attention? Two main reasons. Uh, one is uh, national security. Uh, a lot of the countries that I just mentioned are places of terrorism concern, uh, tribal warlordism, uh, terrible uh, human rights uh, problems. We don't know whether the people who are coming are perpetrators or victims. We don't know who they are at all. They drop their ID cards often at the border before they cross, uh, and that leaves us to try to figure it out. That's a national security issue for the United States. The numbers, according to the New York Times, which actually went down there this year, are uh, 100,000. In a normal year, you're looking at about 8,000, 7,000, 100,000 this year alone. A great many of those migrants I've interviewed uh, they tell me that they're coming because Joe Biden opened the border and he's nicer, and that's the reason that they're coming. And they're dying along the way as well. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to bring, uh, I'm very proud to uh, have uh, Francisco uh, Agapi here, uh, who flew in from Panama, from the, he lives in the Darien Gap. Uh, these are our three panelists. He'll start us off. Uh, he serves as the mayor of Simaco, Panama, which is located in near the Darien province, uh, which is home to the Darien Gap on the Panama side. Uh, this is a region that is uh, a wilderness, no cell phone service, electricity, nothing out there. And the Imbara people uh, live a traditionalist uh, lifestyle, and they are in the 
middle of this mass migration through that gap. And uh, I'm very happy that he's here and that he traveled all this way to uh, share the tribe's experience with that. We also have uh, Michael Yan, who is an award-winning war correspondent. Uh, I brought Michael in because he spent four months in the Darien Gap and in the jungle and with uh, the indigenous peoples there and among the migrants and has a lot of firsthand experience uh, with the situation. Uh, Michael has studied migration from the ground in Morocco, Greece, Lithuania, Colombia, Panama, Mexico, and um, he also has spent a lot of time with the Panamanian police and the migrants and NGOs down there, very knowledgeable about what's happening on both sides, Colombia and Panama. And uh, lastly, we're very uh, happy to have Representative Tom Tiffany, a freshman from Wisconsin, a northern state. Uh, he is here because uh, he understands that southern border security is national security to include his northern state of Wisconsin. And he went to the Darien Gap on his own uh, earlier this year uh, in the canoes, in the jungle, and out with the indigenous people to see firsthand what was happening. Uh, he serves on the Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship uh, and the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security. And we're very happy to have these three panelists here. Uh, I've also spent quite a bit of time in Panama and in Costa Rica with the migrants. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Francisco over on the far end. Uh, he has an interpreter, Carlos, who's going to help him uh, translate his messaging. Francisco. Well, yes. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Francisco Agapi, Alcalde de Distrito Semaco. Semaco. Comarca en Vera de Darien. I don't think this mic is working. It's working. It's working. Okay. Yep. In the district of Darien. Primeramente, gracias a Dios. Eh, por la invitación, Esma, mesa principal y invitados. Bueno, eh, vamos a hablar sobre el problema de migración. Let's talk about the problem of immigration. Del, nosotros, de la población indígena, vivimos en la frontera Panamá y Colombia. My population, the Indian population, we live in uh, the border between Colombia and Panama. Del tema de la migración, de repente no soy la persona indicada para hablar este tema. Sin embargo, hay un problema que ustedes lo conocen, lo saben. The issue of immigration, maybe I'm not the right person to speak about it, but uh, there is an issue that you guys are probably aware of. Ese es un tema de todo el mundo. En Panamá, el problema de migración que se está dando último año, en los últimos años. Uh, it, it's an immigration issue that has uh, showed up in Panama, but it, it's worldwide and it has uh, been uh, pretty prevalent the last few years. Sobre todo estos últimos meses de este año especially, ha sido terrible el problema. Especially uh, in the last few months, it's been a terrible problem for us. El problema allí es que tenemos una comunidad llamado, llamado Bajo Chiquito, una comunidad pequeña de 200 a 300 habitantes. Uh, the community is called Bajo Chiquito and it's about 2 to 300 occupants. Y allí es el punto de llegadas. Y los inmigrantes, hay más inmigrantes que la misma población. That is the first port of entry uh, when they come out of the Darien Gap uh, and there are more migrants and there are uh, people that live in Bajo Chiquito. They, they walk right there to the Bajo Chiquito, right there. Sí, entonces, el, ¿cuáles son los problemas? Ahí tenemos problemas 
prácticamente las tiendas no abatecen de alimento a la población. We, one of the first problems that we have is that our stores, uh, we can't keep uh, the uh, resources full so that we can feed our own people because of all the migrants that are coming through the gap. <coughs> es, la alimentación agrícola igual de un problema. Our agricultural uh, fields is also a problem. Porque mi gente o la población se está dedicando al transportar los inmigrantes y no se está dedicando a la agricultura. The problem with uh, the agriculture is that our people are now focused on transporting the migrants out of Bajo Chiquito instead of focusing on uh, their agrarian lifestyle that they had prior to this. Encima de eso, problemas juveniles, de ahí problemas de robo, problemas violencia, y la juventud se está dedicando a eso. We have juvenile problems, we've got uh, a lot of violence, we have a lot of robberies, um, and... Um, eh, problemas, bueno, todos saben, porque tienen la plata, es ahora el problema del alcoholismo. And now, because they have a lot of money from these migrants, then we have uh, alcohol, alcoholism uh, also becoming a problem amongst our youth. Entonces, este, esa es la parte del problema. Hay problemas, esos son problemas sociales, hay otros problemas ambientales. Those are social problems. We also have environmental problems. Tenemos ahora la contaminación del río. Mi población vive a la orilla del río. We also have um, the, the problem with our rivers. Uh, the people, our people, my people live along the river. Uh, and it's contaminated. Sí, lo que es basura, todos los baños te lo tiran, okay. se hacen ríos. We have trash, we have feces. Encima de eso, otro problema es que cuando los emigrantes, los emigrantes vienen para cruzar el río, cuando el río está crecido, se ahogan, se mueren y se quedan allí. There's also a problem where uh, when the migrants have to cross the river to come into Bajo Chiquito, uh, if, if the river has grown, many of them drown, uh, get swept away by the river, and they, they just they remain in the river. Sí, entonces, este, a mí me toca ir a conversar con la comunidad. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? Porque es un problema no solo mío, sino un problema de todos. Then I have to go and address the community and figure out how we're going to solve this problem because it's not just my problem, it's everybody's problem in that community. Sí, entonces, bueno, aquí estamos para conversar. Gracias. So here we are so we can discuss this. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Francisco. I forgot to mention uh, for those of you who are uh, live watching the live stream, if you have questions for Francisco or any of the panelists, you can email mrt at cis.org. And with that, we'll uh, pass it to uh, Michael Yan. Hello. Yes, I'm Michael Yan. I'm a war correspondent. Uh, my year started off here in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol. Uh, attack, or do you, whatever you want to call it, and uh, did not go inside, but that was quite interesting. Uh, and then was here for the uh, inauguration and then flew straight to the border. So flew straight to, uh, within 24 hours, I was at the El Paso border with Mexico and watching the immediate influx of migrants after the inauguration. Uh, the border patrol was immediately being overwhelmed within the first week. And so I was down in Mexico and all across the border on the southern part, and then finally flew down to Colombia. Because Colombia, we knew that the, the Darien Gap flow was going to increase. So I flew down there with Chuck Holton and Masako here. And we flew down to Colombia, and uh, because in Colombia is where they gather to go through the Darien Gap. And as you know, Darien Gap is a critical uh, funnel point. Now, how do they get to South America? And why do they go to South America? They go to South America because many of the people that want to come in cannot get visas to start off in a place like Mexico. 
So they start in Suriname, or they start in Brazil, or they start in Ecuador. So those are the three countries they start in. A lot of them end up in places like Chile, where they get they live there for years. A lot of these ID cards, for instance, we pick up off the ground before they come into the United States. They they throw them down on the ground. So they'll 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 come to South America, and we're talking people from at least a uh, hundred countries. Like I've met people from Nepal and India and. One guy, I was out in the jungle on the Columbia side in, in, the, in the Darien Gap, and he looked like a Sikh up on the mountain. I said, Sikh man, you know, and he goes, how did you know? And I said, well, I've been to Punjab because I've been to most, many of the countries where they're from. I've spent years in Asia and around the world. And so, uh, and I said, how did you get here? And he came through Netherlands and, oh, planes, trains, and automobiles, and now he's out in the jungle waiting for other Sikh friends, and he said he was going to California if he makes it. So that was on the Colombia side. So they filter in, many of the, especially Haitians and Cubans represent maybe 50% of the people coming through the Darien Gap, and many of those go straight to Suriname, and then they often filter through Chile. Many of the Haitians have lived in Chile for years, uh, as you can see from their ID cards and the many interviews that we've done. And, and then they finally go to here, mostly here, a place called Nacocli. And, uh, we went to Nacocli, and they board boats, which we did too, and they go here, Copragana. And from here, some of them will take boats and go across, not very many, very few. Most go across right here. And, and, uh, and this is very remote. There's a, more than 60 miles of no roads. That's why they call it the Gap, right, the Darien Gap. This is the Darien Isthmus, Isthmus of Panama. And so, so it's called the Gap because there's no roads for more than 60 miles. This is some of the roughest jungle on Earth. It's very biologically active, to put it lightly. That's why we have a screwworm facility up here, which is, this is where we stopped screwworm. If you know what screwworms are, if you're, in, if you're in agriculture and cattle and that sort of thing, it's a really big deal for us to stop the screwworms right here, right? And uh, so we... So we've got a, a, a very expensive program that, uh, that drops uh, uh, flies down here that have been irradiated and are sterile that try to stop the screwworm. So this is a, a channel point for more than just migrants. It's also a biological uh, a, a, a choke point. Down here we see CCP, or let's see, PRC, uh, uh, China is, uh, is denuding the jungle. You see giant trees that they're cutting down. And, uh, and, you know, the yellow fever, the whole works is out there. So bottom line is huge amounts of people, maybe 100,000 this year, come through here. They go through three. The Continental Divide, by the way, goes right through. So the Continental Divide, of course, starts way up north of, of us now and, uh, or, you know, goes up uh, what's well, Continental Divide. And so, as you know, the Continental Divide is where all the water from one side goes to one ocean and the other side goes to the Pacific, Right. And so they crossed these three little mountains up here, finally the Continental Divide, and the third mountain is called the Montaña de la Muerta, the Mountain of Death, and that's where a lot of them die. They fall or they get lost. Uh, there's many people that are stuck out there. They're stuck right now. There's always people stuck out there uh, because they can't go any further. They get hurt or whatever. And uh, for instance, uh, one man, I call him 22 days, his Cuban wife had left him as soon as Biden became president. She struck off for America, and he followed her from Ecuador, and he's stuck out there. He got left behind, and she left him behind. She made it to Texas, by the way, and uh, left him, and he was out there dying in the jungle, and he said, you know, the mosquitoes were so bad, he was using his wife's perfume to, to you know, keep them off, and I was like, this is like out of a movie. He's like, yes, yes, it's a bad, very bad movie. The black <laughs> birds were landing around me, you know, and my wife, she left me in the jungle. And, uh, you know, the big black birds, you know, the ones that eat the flesh. And I said, yeah, there's more, there's more vultures out there than I've seen in anywhere in the world. And uh, I guess, I mean, there's a lot of people die out there. And, you know, there's, uh, we think about 10% of the people that go through die. There's no way for us to know the true numbers because we don't know how many leave Nacocli, uh, and we don't know how many actually come out through Bajo Chiquito. But... After being down there for months and interviewing just tons of people, hundreds, uh, I'm going to guess 10% die out there. And if 100,000 people came through this year, that's 10,000 people. So you can imagine how much those vultures have to eat. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if that's why the vultures are there, but it's a strange amount of vultures. But anyway, so you got a lot of people that get lost out there. They finally come through Bajo Chiquito. They, evolve, they emerge out here 
where I met Francisco. Uh, actually, I met Francisco through uh, missionaries. Anytime I go to a place like this, I look for the missionaries. That's why we call them Christians in Action CIA. They know everything. And <laughs> missionaries uh, introduced me to Francisco. And so I spent a lot of time with Francisco rolling around many jungles. I was out in about 20 jungles probably, uh, or 20 uh, villages, Embara villages. Those are his people. So they, uh, in, and I was out in about 10 with, with, uh, with Francisco. And Fr Francisco took us all out to Bajo Chiquito. I've been out there six times. And so, uh, but I spent about four months out here. And so now his people, Francisco's people, are actually the ones, you've heard about the Indians out there that are raping and murdering the, mm -hmm. the people that come through. So the, the, the causes of death for the people that come through are usually the mountain of death, or they get lost, waterborne illnesses, something else might hit them, yellow fever out there, uh, anything. There's all kinds of uh, problems, and also floods. When they finally get to the river, their bodies come washing down and their tents wrapped up. I mean, flash floods are pretty intense there. And Francisco's people, Embra people are, so when you hear about the Indians raping and robbing, that's what Francisco is trying to stop because they have so many people coming through. Some of his uh, Embra people are out there literally on horsebacks like Comanches and raping and robbing. And he wants to stop this, but it's very difficult to do, right? And so now the Panamanian authorities will tell you they can't close down uh, the, the, the migration route, which is completely false because during the pandemic, they shut it off. It was finished, right? I mean, there was not even a drop coming through during the pandemic. Panama locked down like North Korea for the pandemic, right? So we know that they can shut it off, period. But interestingly, even our, you know, uh, serious people don't know much about what's going on in Panama Canal. For instance, I was telling Dave Petraeus about it. I said, I'm down in Darien. And, uh, and he said, what are you down there for? You should be up in Mexico or the Northern Triangle. I said, well, you know, if I'm here, <laughs> it's... There's a reason why I'm here. I don't waste my time. And uh, this is a, a serious, uh, uh, you know, for intelligence and every other reason in the world, this is where we need to focus assets. We can shut off probably 20% of the people coming through right here. And also the people that are going to come in and blow up a mall, they're more likely to come through here than they are through the Northern Triangle, right? This is where the people are coming in from Yemen. This is where people come in from uh, many Pakistanis and that sort of thing. I meet Bangladeshis out there. Uh, so this is it. This is, this is your choke point. And there's many ways to track them. For instance, they come through Bajo Chiquito, which is Francisco's people, right? This is very easy to shut off. And so that's why I've been down there. And, uh, and of course, I could, I could talk about this for several days, but and I know we don't have much time, so I should turn it back to you. Thank you. Um... Very interesting. If anybody has questions, save them uh, for when we get to the uh, question and answer part. At this point, I'll turn it over to the congressman who was down there. Yeah, thank you very much, Todd. And so on January 20th, the Biden administration unleashed a humanitarian and national security debacle like we haven't seen in a long, long time. And it all traces back to January 20th. Uh, with the end of Remain in Mexico, sending a very clear message across the world that anybody that wants to come to the United States can come to the United States, and we basically have a borderless United States at this point, in particular on the southern border. The um, reason I went down to Panama, uh, I had went to, uh, uh, had went to the Rio Grande in early April, saw what was happening there. Um, the... The Border Patrol said, you really should look deeper than this, where many of these people are coming from. And I really got to thinking about that. And my staff said, hey, uh, what do you think of taking a vacation down to Panama? I've always wanted to go to Panama on vacation. <laughs> and uh, took them up on it. And uh, we were fortunate to get together with these folks to my left to be able to go down there and really, uh, really see what's happening. And by the way, um, the gentleman interpreting over here on our far left, that's Carlos Getz. He's on my staff. And uh, thank the Lord we had him down there in Panama. He was um, um, 
a, a very valuable member of our team, right, Michael? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, when you said you had a, a retired Marine officer, infantry was Iraq, Afghanistan veteran. I was like, <laughs> 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 it was perfect. So it was great. But I, I, I want to thank Francisco for hosting us down there. Thank you very much. And um, it was a great tour that we went on. Um, so we flew into Panama City and went down to the Gap um, with Michael, with Francisco, and then with some of my staff and others. And uh, uh, the first thing that I noticed when we got to the village of Bajo Chiquito, uh, the morning that we took off, we got in Paraguayas, I think is how they pronounce yeah, it. Paraguay. Paraguay. Paraguayas. And uh, we um, uh, went up the river to, um, to the village of Bajo Chiquito. The first thing that I noticed when we got to the village of Bajo Chiquito, when we got out of the Padaguas, was the smell. And we went in and we met with the village leaders there, as well as um, having Francisco along with us. And these people talked about how, you know, they bathe a couple times a day in the river. We heard Francisco allude to that earlier. But their village is overrun at this point, and it was not that way before. And you can tell these people are very clean people. The reason that we smelled the stench that we did is because of the unleashing of the migrants that the Biden administration caused with their order on January 20th. And they, um, um, they verified that for us. When we sat down and had a good meeting with the uh, local villagers, including the head of the village, they shared the story of how um, at times, they have like a 1,000 people a night that will be going through that village. So the village of Bajo Chiquito, give the clicker there a second, once again, Michael. Um, the village of Bajo Chiquito, right off from the Darien Gap, it is the first place where people will come out of the gap or, or through the jungle and then continue on down. And uh, uh, so there was as many as a thousand migrants that were going through there a night and just simply overwhelming the village. And you heard from Francisco earlier some of the harm that is being done as a result of all those people that are coming through and uh, uh, terribly unfortunate. The other thing that I would comment about as we go forward here and we're going to take some questions is your government, those of you that are citizens of the United States of America, is basically complicit in the biggest human trafficking or uh, operation that's gone on, I believe, in the history of the world. And, but there's others that are complicit in it also. And I, need, I think they need to be um, thoroughly investigated, including OIM or IOM, however they go, the Organization for International Migration, which is a United Nations outfit. I think there needs to be a thorough a um, thorough review of what their activities are. And I've also been urging when I do local news uh, uh, interviews is that those people who are involved with faith-based organizations, including Catholic Charities, Lutheran Social Services, the Jewish um, organizations, you need to go back and talk to them and ask them what, uh, what is going on here and how they are involved, because they are part of the chain at this point when you do the resettlement, because I was also very active in talking about what happened at Fort McCoy and the other forts where the Afghan evacuees came through. IOM is right there at this moment working in those forts to resettle people across our country. And um, I believe that they are heavily incentivized with the amount of money that they make to make this happen? And is it in the interest of the American people that they are doing this? This is a question we need to get to the bottom, uh, that we need to get to the bottom of. So, uh, and finally, before I turn it back to Todd here, um, while this is clearly a humanitarian crisis, when we were in Bajo Chiquito, they talked about babies washing down the river and, you know, just a humanitarian crisis of, of epic proportions. But for us in Congress, I believe our number one concern should be national security. Because 
it is clear with the open borders the way they are, and the Border Patrol shares the stories with us all the time. Um, we heard the story of the couple of Yemenis that came in earlier uh, in the country that had terror ties. You know there are people that have terrorist ties that are coming into our country, and the Biden administration is doing very little, if anything, to stem that flow. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, we can uh, begin to take questions uh, for any of the panelists. And if I could, uh, I just have one I'd like to open it up with uh, to uh, Francisco uh, real quickly. You uh, mentioned briefly in your remarks that uh, your people now are earning income, large income, uh, to uh, uh, an extent that uh, you haven't previously, and that uh, there's been a kind of hinted that there's been a corrupting kind of influence. Can you elaborate on what that um, income has done socially with to your uh, tribe? Sí, el problema es que los emigrantes sinceramente traen dinero. Y, y esos dineros son recompensados por el transporte desde Bajo Chiquito a Las Blancas, a una comunidad a punto donde se toma el bus. That money is used to pay for transportation and other resources from Bajo Chiquito to Las Blancas, where they catch bus. Por persona se cobra 25 dólares. They charge 25 dólares a head. Y para mi población, solo imaginar 25% es una buena platita. So if you can imagine that $25 times 100 for my population, that's a lot of good money for uh, the people of Bajo Chiquito and the surrounding villages. Entonces, de ahí surge el problema. So Pro that's a source of the problem. El problema es... Primeramente, es del alcohol, sobre todo la juventud. First problem is alcohol, especially in our younger generation. Y prácticamente igual, cuando están alcoholizados, ya un problema, se convierte en un problema familiar entre parejas, marido y mujer. So when they become alcoholics, then it becomes a family problem between uh, married couples and families. Y algunos jóvenes se emigran hasta la ciudad con la con la plata. And so a lot of these young folk leave uh, Bajo Chiquito and go all the way to the city, Panama City, with that money that they've gotten. Y con la misma plata igual se compra drogas para poder revender. Uh, and with that money then they go to Panama City and buy drugs so that they can then uh, sell, distribute. Entonces eso se ha convertido en un problema social grandísimo. So this has become a, a pretty ginormous uh, social issue for us. No sé, tal vez una pregunta. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can. Let me add one thing real quickly. When we were at Bajo Chiquito, they had a beautiful little school there. The kids going to school. And uh, they just had an event that was going on that day where they were doing a presentation. And it was just wonderful to see that happening. But you could see how they had to segregate that off from um, their city, uh, their village square, where they had all these people who were squatting, defecating, hundreds of people doing something like that right in their village, which was so unfortunate to see that happen, uh, see that happening. And we asked them, did you have this problem before? And they said, we've always had uh, migrants coming through our village, but nothing like the scale of the last um, of the scale of 2021. 
Thank you. Sorry. Um, first, Francisco, bienvenidos a Washington. Uh, yes. I actually have a two-part question. So the first part is, is for Francisco. I'm curious if the influx of migrants is starting to spread into the neighboring Guna tribes, if they're also starting to experience the same problems. And then for Michael, the second part of the question is, is uh, Centerfront, the frontier police for Panama, are they basically ceding the control of the Darien Gap to migrants and criminal organizations? Hold that. Uh, remember that that part of the question. We'll go Francisco first. It's a good question. Sí, este, la inmigración, estos últimos meses, sí ha entrado a la comarca Cunayala. Sí, ya se ve la presencia, porque ellos están creando otras rutas que no es Bajo Chiquito, está creando otra que es por membrillo que es más fácil entrar por Cunayala. So, uh, he's saying that uh, this, this immigration has, uh, over the last few months, it has bled over into some of the other districts. Uh, and more recently, they've created other routes that are easier uh, to get to some of these other districts as well. So that, that migration is actually bleeding over into to other tribes. Gracias, Francis. Michael? On the center front, center front is the Panamanian Border Police. Uh, they're very professional. Uh, they've been trained by U.S. forces for years. They're really squared away. Uh, and... Uh, uh, needless to say, I've made inroads, and we could actually get one of their commanders to come. We could have had one sitting here today, actually, uh, and they could tell you what they're doing. But they have not ceded control. But it is, you know, it's the Darien Gap. You know, it's a proper jungle, and uh, they do have a base right here. I rented an airplane and flew right here uh, with Masako, actually, because we couldn't get. There's no Google Earth photos or anything like that of uh, of Bajo Chiquito, so we rented an airplane and made our own. And so, because before we took you guys out, I wanted to know, you know didn't want to get you killed or something, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> it's bad for my I reputation to lose, you know, go Jonestown out here with Congressman. So, you know, and so, and so, you know, it was a little dangerous what you did. So, and, uh, and so, um, and uh, so, but, you know, there are center front bases out here and they've got a special operations force. I've been all out in this part as well. And uh, they don't cross over here so much, though. But they haven't ceded control, but they, you know, the center front could stop them. If Panamanian authority said stop them, they would be stopped. There's no question about it, but they just haven't been given that order. And if I can add to that, uh, from my experience in Panama and the Darien area, uh, the Panamanian government, as a matter of policy, has center front collecting these migrants, gathering them up, and bringing them into what I call hospitality camps, uh, where they provide uh, all the basic necessities and medical attention and the rest. And then they arrange for bus transportation for all of them uh, in an organized way to the uh, north uh, into Costa Rica, which is rinse, wash, and repeat. The Costa Ricans do this as well. This is a formal policy. They call it controlled flow. They, uh, up until COVID, they were under orders to, per, to carry out controlled flow with the migrants as, a, as official government policy. And then when COVID broke out, they were told to shut the border down and they did. Uh, so Cinefront uh, could control the border if, uh, because it's a choke point. I mean, you can see from the map, uh, but uh, the, Government stance is to do the exact opposite, to move them through. You know, it's very much like a pipeline. It is so, so ironic. January 20th, what's the first two executive orders from the Biden administration? One, shut down Keystone, shut down a pipeline for, that gets us energy independence in America, but to open up the pipeline from Panama. And it, and it acts exactly as a pipeline. What you heard Todd describe there. It, it, for those of you familiar with pipelines, they have pumping stations, right? These are pumping stations. You go from Panama up to Costa Rica. Costa Rica pumps them up to Nicaragua. And it works its way up just like a pipeline. And also the Colombians are complicit. They work in close coordination as a government with the Panamanians and the Costa Ricans. They all work to keep make sure that the flow is smooth and not 
not too big of a buildup in Colombia or any of those countries. Mark, before you ask your question, real quick, I want to ask a question to Todd. When you've been at those camps, have you seen the International Organization for Migration? Have they been at any of those camps? Uh, I, I actually, on my trips, I did not see any down okay. there, but I, I know that they had NGOs in and around the area. Because it's really interesting. I've seen them at the southern border. I saw them in, we saw them um, down in Panama, saw them at Fort McCoy also. They are everywhere doing these resettlements of these mass migrations. Also on that, I, <clears throat> this year, I looked, I, I, I tried to develop context on everything. So I studied, I was in Morocco this year studying weaponization of migrations, uh, Greece and Bulgaria. And then when Belarus started pumping people into Lithuania, I flew straight from Africa to Lithuania, right? I happened to be with the Lithuanian army in Afghanistan, so I kept my contacts. And so I just spent three weeks with their intelligence people and their army and their border patrol. You know, Belarus is Lukashenko, the, the uh, dictator, is pumping people into Lithuania and trying to push them across into Poland, where I, I lived in Poland two years. I know Poland's not going to take them. And the, uh, but uh, OIM immediately showed up. And I told their... Uh, their uh, there are Lithuanian army and intel guys like, watch, OIM will show up, NRC will show up, Norwegian Refugee Council. It's an ecosystem that Mark. follows them around. It's not just affecting us. It's affecting everybody. Mark? Yeah, I had um, a couple of questions. Well, main question is, why isn't the Panamanian government shutting this down? Maybe the mayor has some ideas, or maybe <laughs> Michael does. And also, are there larger organizations whether they're drug cartels or just human smuggling organizations that are kind of have authority and power over these areas. Okay. 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 Uh, I, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> definitely. I mean, there's cartels, for instance, uh, well, for instance, uh, right here at Cupragana or here, here at Nacocli, you can see people are making money every step of the way. Like I, I like what Tom said, pumping stations. Uh, and it's not just one cartel. I was talking with Bannon about this at one point, Steve Bannon. He's like, oh, there's no cartels pumping. And I was like, yes, they are. But it's just different ones. And once you get over here, they hand them off to some others. We film some of them going up into the jungle. It's just different groups. Finally, they get into to Francisco's people. These aren't Francisco's people right here. This is a different group that we flew out and talked with coyotes here. Uh, but then once they get past here and they go over the Continental Divide, then they come into the Imbara people and they come into Francisco's people. They take their share They, um, uh, in various ways, robbery and uh, also uh, charging them for boat rides and whatnot. Then the center front picks them up in Bajo Chiquito, which is uh, under, uh, under control of Francisco. And, and then they go on boats for several hours and they, get, they go to three different camps. And in these camps, that's where OIM meets them, or actually OIM meets them in Bajo Chiquito as well. And, and, and the center front then pumps them up, they put them on buses, and they take them to Costa Rica. And that's the controlled fro flow program between Costa Rica but and once Panama. Once they're in Panama, I get Panama's interest in moving along. Why isn't the Panamanian government well, why are we twisting their arms to shut it down? I, I call it HOP, human osmotic pressure, right? There's the push and there's the pull, right? And one of the things I found in all these border areas I go to around the world, there is no wall big enough to stop the HOP, right? Uh, you need three different things. You need a barrier, you need people to guard that barrier, and then you need the political will to stop them. If the Darien Gap with probably 10% dying going through, much less... You, you won't believe the casualties we see, uh, the injuries. Uh, uh, they still come. We're up over in Morocco. They're going to Ceuta and Melilla, those two cities, and they go across the Med. Uh, it, it, it's just a, it, every. It's the same. When I grew up in Florida, they were coming across from Cuba. So uh, they can stop them. But when we're throwing the corn in the United States, we're feeding the pigeons. I mean, they're going to get through. I mean, if you offered me four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I could get through the gap, you know. Uh, and 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 so it's it's a um, they and it doesn't matter if it's really offered. For instance, Chuck Holton, somebody that uh, you know well, is a war correspondent. I was just in Morocco with Chuck. He was just in Syria. He just got back from Syria to Panama. When Chuck was in Syria, he just told me that people were talking about that four hundred and fifty thousand dollars as if it were true. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. They think it's true, and so it's psychological corn. They're going to go for it. 
and a certain percentage are going to make it. But Panama can definitely cut them down because they've got easy choke points, and they do have the the uh, Darien Gap as a baffle, right? I'd like but to. They're making money. I'd like to get Francisco's take on that uh, question too, uh, just with a little bit of a uh, an angle to it. Uh, is the Panama? Do you feel that the Panamanian government is aware of the stresses that this is causing on your people, and what? messaging do you have for your government in Panama to stop to protect your people bueno eh, la verdad el tema del gobierno panameño no sabría decirles Sí, qué convenio tendrán, pero qué convenio. So, uh, as it relates to the Panamanian government, uh, I wouldn't know what to tell you uh, on their approach or how they're looking at this. So, pero, si, I'm sorry. Pero sin embargo, sí sé que you know. parar la migración en, en Panamá sería otro caos, otro problema más grande. I know that stopping the immigration into Panama would be another problem, another chaos. Porque si los migrantes se meten por todas las selvas, o sea, no hay una sola entrada, sino hay entrada por todo lado y llegan a Darien. Because the migrants uh, go through many different uh, paths to get to uh, the interior of Panama. Es, entonces, claro, ahora el gobierno ha tratado de frenar hasta donde se con Senafron. I know that the government has tried, as far as I know, uh, to slow the migration down with the Senafron, uh, their border patrol. Ya ha sido imposible. And it's been impossible. Estuvimos una experiencia para el tema de la pandemia. We had an experience uh, during the pandemic. Tratam, trataron de parar toda la migración. We tried to stop, or Panama tried to stop all of the migration. Y y en una comunidad hicieron un desastre ellos los migrantes para poder pasar. In 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 one of the communities the migrants came and created a disaster in that small village. Um, Peñita en, la, en Puerto Peñita quisieron quemaron un pequeño de de primer auxilio donde había medicinas quemaron eh, que algunas casas que so the migrants came and uh, in that village, uh, because the migration was trying to be, be stemmed, uh, they burned first aid kits, they burned houses. Bienes como carros. Uh, they, they damaged property, uh, cars. Y entonces, al final, lo pasar, pues. Finally, the people just gave up and let the migrants pass. Sí, son problemas. Sí. So that would cause a lot of problems for us. You were in that village, by the way. Francisco, uh, there are a great many humanitarian human rights organizations and non-governmental organizations that are concerned with protecting indigenous tribes from uh, uh, external pressures and uh, stresses like this. Have you heard from any American human rights organizations that are concerned with indigenous peoples at all to date about what's happening. Hasta ahorita Ninguna. Gracias a Dios. Esta es mi primera visita y gracias a esta organización, que es la primera organización que lo estoy, te lo estamos conociendo. Until now, nobody has reached out to me, but thank God that, uh, you know, this is my first time with you guys and you guys have reached out to us. Solo quiero comentar algo en temas del, del derecho humano. Uh, I just want to mention something uh, as, it, as it relates to human rights. Estuve en las fiscalías, me llamaron, eh, fiscalías 
donde procesan culpables por violentar leyes por un derecho que estoy peleando. I was in the prosecutor's office. Por el tema de uso de arma en la población indígena. Because of the issue of using weapons uh, in indig indigenous populations. Mis, Firearms. Mi, 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 mi gente, los abuelos, tienen armas por herencia. Padre, hijo, abuelo. Mm -hmm. uh, my people, uh, grandparents, they, uh, they pass it down from generation to generation, long rifles. Entonces, esas armas, la juventud, algunos, no todos, algunos, lo utilizan para robar con esa arma. Eso es verdad. Some of those uh, weapons are being mishandled by some of our young folk, uh, and they are using them instead of for hunting to uh, go and rob people. Entonces, al final, la fiscalía echa la culpa al dueño del arma, que es un abuelo, una abuelita. So the prosecutor traces back uh, the ownership of the weapon, and they uh, actually charge the grandfather, uh, the grandmother, the older folks that actually had the weapon, not the actual person that was in possession of the weapon during the commission of the crime. Pensando, Senafron o la fiscalía, Senafron y la policía, pensando que esa arma lo alquila para que roben. Because uh, the Senafron and or the prosecution uh, or the police department believe that the elders are renting these weapons out to these young folk so that they can go commit these crimes. Entonces, cuando estamos en la fiscalía, me llaman que yo apadrino el, el robo, las armas. So, so when I have to present myself in front of uh, the prosecution, uh, they're accusing me that I am essentially like the godfather of this operation and I am renting these weapons out. Entonces, el derecho que peleamos nosotros como población indígena es cuando quedamos sin alimentos, porque los inmigrantes pasan por el, algunas fincas pequeñas de agriculturas. So, so one of the rights that we're fighting for, uh, human rights, is uh, just our sustenance, because a lot of these immigrants are passing through our uh, fields. Ellos agarran algunas, algunos productos. They take a lot of our uh, crop. Entonces las familias se quedan sin alimento. ¿Quién pelea el derecho del pueblo indígena? ¿Quién pelea el derecho de la alimentación? So Pero, a lot of folks are without food, without crops, uh, and we're the only ones that are fighting for this. There are no other organizations that are recognizing that this is a problem and fighting for us. No hay una organización que pelea el derecho del pueblo indígena hasta ahorita. No hay una organización de There is, there are no organizations that are fighting for our human rights. Yeah. Thank you. We have a couple more questions uh, here. Mayor Gabi, thank you for being with us today. I don't know if this thing's on. Uh, my question is for uh, you, Mr. Yon, or anyone else who may have, or anyone else who may hold this uh, knowledge in their mind. Um, from a national security perspective, the regional hostile elements like the FARC 57 Front, the cartels from you know Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico, are we seeing coordination between those organizations for the first time? And is there is that creating a vacuum for sort of an international hostile elements to come in uh, and further out? Oh, he translates. I'll mention a few things. <clears throat> out here, it, I mean, we know drugs come through there, but as you know, drugs come in in a lot of ways. So that's just one ant trail. But... Uh, but out here, it's mostly opportunistic, the people that live around here. I mean, it's not like armed. I mean, there are the armed FARC out here, as you well know, right? Uh, and, and, and some of the FARC are definitely uh, Francisco's people. But, uh, but a lot of it's just the local villagers. Like, I photographed some of the people doing the murders and rapes. I mean, I mean we know who some of them are. Uh, and they're just local village guys. Because, as you know, um, in life, most, most of the criminality happens from people that live in that area, right? And this is certainly no different. You're not going to be able to come in from Panama City or, you know, Medellin or someplace and go do criminality out here. That's not your jungle. This is his jungle. 
Francisco. Bueno, la verdad, no, igual, no sabría decirle si hay una organización que contribuya junto con la FARC o con otras organizaciones criminales. Pero sí se sabe que mi gente ha estado involucrado en temas de, de migración, temas de droga, en todo. Pero, pero I do know that some of my people have been involved in some of the criminality that, uh, you know, they did the immigration uh, push, the, uh, the drugs. Sí, eh, pues eso es lo que puedo decir en tema de eso, porque no he estado investigando sobre ese tema. That's all I can say on that because I haven't really uh, investigated uh, the different criminal elements as, as potential cartels and whether there's coordination between them. Solo sé que se ha aumentado, incrementado la droga, tráfico. But I do know that, that uh, drugs have become more prevalent and the trafficking of drugs is also uh, more prevalent. Gracias. Thank you. Well, I think you can count on it being a terrific recruiting tool for them because there's so much money at stake. I mean, when we're in Bajo Chiquito, there's a Western Union there. And uh, you see that wherever you're going in the pipeline is there's a, a way to access money. The money is simply enormous. And while I don't have detailed insider information like what's happening at the southern border, you hear all the stories about how the cartel controls the southern border and they control it um, for money. I mean, they make a tremendous amount of money off from it. And you think we alluded to the $450,000 payments. Um, if anything that like that would ever happen, you can count on the cartels are going to own that $450,000 or a very sizable chunk of it. Let me mention that Western Union and MoneyGram. That's Bajo Chiquito, right? Out here in the jungle, there's no phones actually there. You have to go to one thing I've learned around the world is every remote village, they know where's the closest place you can get cell phone connection. They'll be like, you go put it on the bamboo pole up near that big tree. Uh, and there's one here, they call it Cell Phone Hill. But there's actually, it's not, yeah, it's called Cell Phone Hill, which right outside Bajo Chiquito. And so, um, so the actual Western Union is up in Panama City. So what happens is you go in, they'll charge 20% in here. There's no Western Union here. They have the sign up. And then uh, you, the, you, somebody will send the Western Union to Panama City. They'll send a text, which goes to Cell Phone Hill. They walk down the hill into the village, and it's a Hawala system. You know Hawala? You know the Islamic system for money transfer? Basically, they'll send a code like pink rainbow or something, you know? And uh, and then they'll go into Bajo Chiquito and get their money and be charged 20%. So that's how they get a lot of the migrants. Uh, they know they're going to get robbed out here. Some women carry the morning after pills who know they're going to get raped or whatever. And uh, they, uh, they'll Western Union money to themselves. So when they come out there, they've already got money. Either their family does it. They have a problem getting it from the United States, by the way. So many people are, are doing the Western unions from France and other places. Much of which uh, ends up in uh, tribal hands and in a corrupting way. Uh, we had another question. Yeah, so um, of course we were at the border together just recently. But uh, Representative Tom Tiffany, Tiffany, can you tell us more about IOM, OIM, it's both? Uh, this UN organization, which is under the UN Human Rights Council, which China runs, how much of a coordinating role does this organization play with this human trafficking operation? And also, Michael Young, can you tell us a bit more of your research um, specifically on weaponization of migration? So, um, it's a question that we need more answers to, and I know there are some of my colleagues in the House that are doing more digging on IOM or OIM, however you want to refer to them, and um, we need answers uh, in regards to what this organization is doing. It's, it's interesting because just a week ago, I was in the Minneapolis airport flying out to Washington, D.C. Who did I see in the Minneapolis airport? It was a couple people with IOM vests on, and I believe they were probably sending um, evacuees who were at Fort McCoy, is what I would guess, 
Um, they appeared to be Afghans, and they were headed to on the same flight as I was to Washington, D.C., and I overheard later that they were going to Washington, D.C., and then down to Tampa. Um, uh, I hope Governor DeSantis um, has the welcome mat out for them down there. And uh, uh, But what's really interesting is you, I've seen them at every stop now. When I was down at the southern border at McAllen and then went down to uh, Panama, I mean, they had a major facility. If you remember that big tent that they had set up, yeah. um, after the migrants would come out on the Paraguas on the uh, Turquesa River, they had a little community. Do you remember the name of that town that they were settled in? It's where we stayed in that little motel. Uh, San Vicente. Uh, yeah. So anyhow, they had a, a big camp set up there with tents and uh, you know temporarily set up. And very prominently was a sign there that said IOM. And then when I went to Fort McCoy at the end of August, when they just started bringing in the evacuees from Afghanistan, it's one of the things we heard from the commanding officer when we asked him, what's the process, things like that. He talked about you know, the resettlement organizations, Catholic charities, other faith-based organizations. But he also said that IOM will be here um, uh, coordinating the handoff of the evacuees to those faith-based organizations. They, care, they are, uh, it's very clear, they have a critical role in the process of moving these people, as generally calling them migrants, into the United States. They have a critical role, and we need to get some answers as far as how they're being compensated. Um, what authority are they, they using? My understanding is that the State Department um, uh, contracts with them to do this process, but we need a lot more answers because at this point, for the American people, they're working in the shadows doing this, and there needs to be much more sunlight that is put on this process. Um, we're running a little short of time, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to intervene on completing that one just because I want to say something. Okay, before you shut up. <laughs> I I was, as you can see, I'm going through ID cards, and, and we have cards for, they give debit cards out for the UN. They still give you like $300 on the yeah, debit Yeah, we card. were in uh, Reynosa the week before last and watched the IOM hand out cash debit cards to uh, migrants in a long line, $400 every two weeks and $800 a month. Uh, it's which different is very, amounts in different countries, right? And it's very sustaining. It keeps them in northern Mexico uh, in beans enough to get over eventually. But let, let me say something. Uh, these these just got FedExed in from somebody I paid in Mexico to collect these by the river. Well, I was just down there and, well, these just came in. Uh, and uh, so I'm just looking through the cards now. I've got another stack back here that I've already, and look what I just found. U.S. Department of Justice inmate ID. I just found this as we're talking. It's got the guy's name. This is a criminal apparently was trying to get in. This is, look at that. This guy's name. <laughs> Literally, this is why I pay people to collect ID cards. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's like, I'm like, he's okay, documented. there's a new one. Marguerite. Yeah, I, I have a question for Rupert. I mean, you sit on the immigration um, subcommittee. Um, how many representatives on the left and on the right are actually paying attention to the Darien Gap, educating themselves on the Darien Gap? Um, and on what you're discussing about the IOM. Is it a conversation? Um, there's starting to become more awareness, not enough at this point, but um, certainly like Congressman Biggs is very, um, understands this quite well, but he's got his hands full down on the border in Arizona and uh, has been such a great resource for all of us. Um, but I'm hearing that there are other representatives that are starting to take a look at, we need to do this trip down to uh, uh, Panama, Central America, and South America. And also, it's heartening to know that Representative Gooden, he, he and his office are starting to look very deep into OIM. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, what they're going to find. But um, uh, first of all, the majority right now should be having hearings on this. There should be hearings that are going on on this whole process to provide the sunshine that we're talking about um, on this whole process and how it works. And uh, But if the majority won't do it now, 
Uh, the majority in the next Congress will. Uh, I, we have to wrap things up. Uh, we're out of time, but I have another question for Francisco real quickly. Um, can you, do you have any message for American policymakers? You're here in Washington. Uh, what would you tell them about what's happening to your people and about this mass migration through your villages? Sí, eh, mi mensaje es que bueno, que pongamos atención, es un esfuerzo de todos, de ambos grupos, de, de algunas organizaciones y para los representantes de aquí, los colegas políticos, que pongamos atención. Este es un problema, reitero, este es un problema de todos. Yo solo quiero... Este es un problema para todos y todas las organizaciones que están involucradas, incluyendo los políticos aquí. Si nos pueden ayudar... You can help us. Al menos una botellita de agua para mi población. Al menos una pequeña botella de agua para mi gente. Tema de salud. Tema de educación que últimamente ha afectado a los niños. The issues of health, education that ultimately has affected our kids. Porque los niños no están concentrados en el estudio por mucha mucha gente, muchos inmigrantes allí en ese pueblo. Uh, our kids can't even concentrate on education because we are overwhelmed with so many immigrants. Entonces, aquí vamos a estar frente por cualquier consulta, dudas, y lo invito, y lo invito a mi pueblo. A Panamá, and we'll be here para que conozcan Darien Comarca. And, and we're going to confront this, uh, and I invite you to come down to Darien personally, so that you can see, and I can introduce you to the Darien uh, and, and our people down there. Bienvenido a Panamá, gracias. Welcome to Panama, thank you. Okay, thank you, and um, with that, we'll uh, wrap it up. Thank you uh, for attending, and uh, this will be on, is recorded and will be on our website where it can be uh, watched again and passed around and shared with folks who might have missed it. All right.